So he will tell you more about himself and the topic that he's going Hi, good morning all of you. I understand it's really difficult to wake up on a Saturday morning and you know, come to a gathering like this. It's always a privilege to be a part of this gathering. I have always felt that it adds to my uh, knowledge. Okay, so to start with, my name is Prince Mishra and I'm currently working with Philips Lighting uh, as a quality product lead. I sometimes, or maybe you know, more than sometimes, I also help the teams with uh, you know reinforcing agile values and principles that uh, we see you know building that thing sometimes so that that way I'm playing a dual role. So the topic that we're going to talk about today is systems thinking. Uh, let me start with a disclaimer: I'm not an expert in systems thinking. Uh, maybe. I am nowhere in terms of uh, being an expert in systems thinking, but the reason why I picked up this topic for today is uh, I, I understand that the best way of learning a particular thing is if you are trying to teach it to somebody. That gives you the most leverage in terms of how best you can learn it. So it's not a session for you guys, it's not a session for myself. I want to be more proficient in the systems thinking, so that's the reason why I chose this topic. I have objectives. Uh, when I say uh, I'm going to present this in the the first objective is to initiate you into the world of systems thinking. Right? So, what actually systems are, what actually system thinking is, how do you identify a system, how do you identify the different loops that are there in the system, and how do you identify those leverage points, the points of leverage in the system, which can maximize the kind of outcome that we're expecting out of the system. Right? So, if I'm able to do that initiation for you guys, I have already succeeded in the target that I have for myself. Right? Okay, so very quickly, how many of us understand what systems thinking is here? In this crowd, how many of us know what is systems thinking to, to, to any extent? I mean, uh, as a beginner, okay, I have a friend and a supporter here. So if I'm stuck with answering one of your questions, probably you will help me out. Anybody else? Please join in. Okay, anyone else? Okay, uh, so great. So now, what do you think? Uh, okay, let me not drag it further. In the next 45 minutes that we are going to spend here, we are going to talk about what a system is. We are going to see what a collection is versus what a system is. Then, how do you identify a system? What is? What are the different kinds of systems that we encounter in the real world? Right. So what, what is system diversity basically? Then we jump on the topic of what systems thinking is. And we'll also see uh, what learning organizations are. And what is it that plays agile transformations? Many a times we see that okay, we have uh, tried being agile for a long time, but at the end the result is more output driven than outcome driven. Right? So so what, what is it that hinders that uh, success of agile transformations? We try to see that from our systems perspective. And my talk is inspired uh, by the book called The Fifth Discipline, The Art and the Practice of the Learning Organization that we just did. And uh, he's a party uh, in the field of systems thinking already. Systems thinking is not created by him for that matter. Uh, it was way uh, back in 1987 that the term was first coined. But this book in itself is an epic. So if you have already read it well enough, otherwise I would recommend that you go back and try to get, uh, get hold of this book and try to go through the pages that you have. And there is the talk by Dr. Russell Akoff. He is uh, another uh, uh, very prominent figure in the uh, organization behavior field. Right? So if you search by his uh, talks by Dr. Russell Akoff on system thinking on uh, YouTube, you will get a host of things. And most of the things that he said as part of his talk is what I going to do So it's a presentation brought in by Dr. Okay, so what is the system? What, what, what is Do you see a system here somewhere? Does, does this picture look uh, you know, kind of familiar to you guys? So looking at this, what do you think a system is? A system is, uh, you know, let's talk about an elephant. Is it a system? It's a system? Yes? It's a system. We all agree. What about the task of the elephant? Is it a system? It's a path, right? 
the legs, the tail, the ears, right? It's all us. It's all elements in that system or parts in that system. It's not a system within itself, right? So, when you are not looking at the whole elephant and you are probably trying try to you know, feel the tail of the elephant, you are just shown that picture. So, now try to correlate this with the real project that you are working in. You do not know the big picture, you are just shown, okay, this is the part on which you are going to work and therefore, this is what you should be knowing. What do you do? You will come, you, you, you come to a situation like this, where you are just looking at the tail of an elephant and thinking that it might be a rope. Somebody would think it is a snake. Right? You are looking at the tusk and you, you get a different feeling, but you, you cannot imagine an elephant in itself, right? unless you are shown that whole picture. So what we are going to do here is, we are trying to see the whole picture. And that whole picture is nothing but the system. To formalize the definition of a system, it's a group of interactive, interrelated, or interdependent parts. All of these are very, very important words here. They are the keywords. If you miss any one of them, you miss the whole system as such. So you have an interactive, interrelated, and or, or interdependent parts that form a complex and unified whole that has a specific purpose. Let us spend some time on this slide. If we are able to understand this slide properly, we are able to understand the rest of the things, you know, without much of effort. So what do we mean by interacting here? How does a tail interact with the leg of the elephant? Does it have any relationship with the tail and the legs? System by interface. Sorry? System by interface. Yeah, in the whole system of things, it does have a role to play which impacts the whole system. So you would know that the tail helps in balancing this, balancing the movements. If you cut the tail of a, the tail of a monkey, that means will not be in a position to climb high trees or uh, trees which are of big, you know, great heights. It helps in balancing. So a tail has a role to play in the whole system. You, you chop off one of the legs, what do you get? You get an elephant with three legs. Does it impact the system? Yes, it does. Right? Similarly, what we are trying to say is each of the parts here interact with each other in coordination right? and it impacts the whole purpose of the system. What is the purpose of this system? What is the purpose of an elephant? Walk run and eat. Hmm? Walk run and eat. Walk run and eat, survive? Survive. survive. It has a life, it has a purpose. Right? So all these parts are in coordination with each other, it, interact, it interacts with each other. right? And therefore, it's a complex and unified whole. Now, we'll also see that a system is not just a collection of parts, right? The sum of parts should be more than the whole for it to be called as a system. We'll see how that is relevant, when that is relevant, and what happens if that is not the case, right? Okay. Now that we know what a system is, what are those characteristics that we should be looking at to say whether we are talking about a system or we are talking about something else? We already spoke about it, systems have purpose, right? All systems should have purpose. <clears throat> if not, we are not looking at a system. All parts of the system must be present for a system to carry out its purpose optimally. If there is a part which is not impacting the overall behavior or purpose of the system, that part should not ideally be a part of the system. Which means that the system does not create that part, therefore that part can easily and safely be removed out of the system without actually damaging the purpose of the uh, all, all, all our system. So all parts of the system must be present. The order in which the parts are arranged affects the performance of the system. Quite clear, right? So we cannot uh, put the trunk in the place of a tail and vice versa. It doesn't make any different price. Systems attempt to maintain stability through feedback. This is important. We'll talk about this in more details in a little bit more technical terms when we go ahead to the slides. So let us mark all your uh, doubts out there. Now the whole is more than some of its parts. This is what we are talking about. Let's put together all the, you know, let's talk about an automobile. You have the best in class automobiles, so there are, I understand that there are close to 450 different varieties of automobiles that you have uh, in the market today. Let's, let's pull out all the best possible parts from each of those automobiles. Let's, let's pull out the best engine from one of them, the best transmission from the other one, the best gear system from the next one, and so on and so forth. Let's try to put the whole together. So, so, would you be getting a getting the best in great automobile there? No. Why? You have the best of things. Those are not integrated. Yes, they are not meant to be coordinating with each other because they are all from a different automobile that we have picked up. We are not even going to get an automobile, right? 
we are probably going to get a collection and not a system out there. So, the whole is more than some of its parts. When we say that, it also means that if you just aggregate the parts, you don't get a system. There has to be something more than that which infuses it with the purpose that the system is supposed to have. Right? So, the parts of an elephant you put together, it does not give an elephant unless you have that thing called life inside it. Right? The whole and part are related abstractions. You can talk about it. Every system has a boundary. If you have a system without a boundary, you are probably looking at something very, very, very complicated which cannot be managed. So you always have to think of systems from a, a perspective of having a boundary drawn around it. Otherwise, you are not going to do anything good with that abstraction that you are creating. And it is always subject to redefinition by changing the perspective. Which means, as an agile approach, if I look at the organization, the kind of system that I will identify will be different. As a person who is heading the department of finance, when he looks at the system, his level of abstraction, his level of uh, interpretation of the system will be different. Right? Now, let's talk about a few things. What is this? The basket? Is it a system or a collection? Collection. Uh, yes. Anybody who wants to say it is a system? Okay. This can be a system if you look at the last part of it. Always subject to redefinition by changing the perspective. Now, there are certain fruits which you, if you put them together, if you put them together, you know the rate of decay increases or decreases. Right? So, if I am looking at it from the perspective of a person who studies that science, I don't know what it is called, if it is called, uh, let us say, he is called a frugologist or something, <laughs> if he is a frugologist, he will probably think it is a system. Right? So, what we are seeing now here is collection as well as a system. So, point number last. Always subject to redefinition by changing the perspective. From his perspective with the system, from my perspective, your perspective, it is just a basket of fruits. What about this? This is a refrigerator by the way. Right? This is a system. This is a system. This is a system. Yeah. I don't call it as a collection anymore. Yeah. By whatever you want, probably this service will be a system. What about this? This is a little bit and put it from the internet. I don't know whether this is still relevant or not. This is a system. This is a system? Yes. And why? They interact. They interact. They coordinate with each other. They are interdependent yes. to fulfill the purpose of the system. Yes. So to win a game, they have to coordinate with each other. Brilliant. What about this? What is this picture? Take it by the way. <laughs> what is this picture all about? No comments. Ah, no comments. Wonderful. Okay, I, I, I will show you this picture now. No comments. This is a system. This has to be a system. If it is a collection, then you are probably <laughs> collecting. This is a collection. They also interact. They interact. They do not coordinate. They interact in the negative way sometimes. Sometimes <laughs> <or possibly. laughs> so this is possibly a, a situation when you know you must have a system for it to give you the best results. This is what version one. Okay. <laughs> now when we are looking at a system, we have to look out for these things. These are the critical elements of uh, the whole theory that we are talking about. We have to look out for the elements, look out for the interconnections, the way they interact with each other, look out for the functionality. Or purpose, functionality in case of a non human system or a non living system, let us, let us be more precise. And purpose in case of human systems. So, if we have the moment we introduce human beings or living beings in a system, we start looking at the purpose rather than functionality. We become more, uh, you know, sensitive towards the usage of the right words there. Okay. Now, there are different ways in which you can categorize the system. A system could be a simple system, it could be a complicated system, if you are categorizing in the base, on the basis of structure. So the way a system is structured, there could be a simple system or a complicated system. Now, you said behavior, right? You said behavior and purpose. If the behavior is predictable or not predictable, predictable to what extent? If you are looking at that parameter, we can have an ordered system, we can have a complex system, we can have a chaotic system. Now, because a system will have both these dimensions present together at any given point in time, right? So, a system may not just be categorized as a structured or a non-structured system based on uh, complexity or whatever. It has to be have having both the dimensions. 
has to be having a structure as well as a behavior. Therefore, we try to map on this, uh, the, the, uh, I would say the quadrants that we have here, not the quadrant, whatever you want to call it. I don't have the right words. So, when you say behavior, behavior is nothing but your ability to predict the behavior of the system. So, if you are saying, I can say what a particular system will do with a lot of, uh, you know, I am very, very sure that what this system is going to do. With a lot of conviction, I can predict the behavior of that system. You are looking at an order system. If that system does not have too many parts in it, it is a simple and ordered system. Right? Similarly, the, the, the level of predict predictability decreases as you move from order to chaotic systems. And the structure gets more and more complex as you move from simple to complicated systems. So, as an example, if you see a stapler, right? this is a very ordered and simple. So, if you press it, if you change the pins inside it, it will stable. If it doesn't, it will not stable. So very much predictable in behavior, right? It is not going to transform itself into you know, an animal or something. It is still going to be a, uh, a stapler that will do a very predictable job. Not too many components are there, that's why it is a simple system. What is this? I don't set light. Right? Too many paths, therefore complicated. But still, you can predict the behavior to an extent, therefore, what is this? Slump meeting. Slump meeting. Slump meeting. Okay, now, a point to note out here is that you have individuals there, like you have human beings there. The moment you introduce human beings into a system, it becomes a complex system. Because, more or less, you will not be able to predict the outcome. Right? That's why on the behavior aspect, the predictability moves from simple to complex. Because they have feelings, they have emotions, they have egos, they have their own individual identities, which they want to you know, guard against. A lot of psychological things come into the picture, you have hormones that work with each other and create a separate kind of a behavior for yourself. So they are all complex systems. Okay. Okay, so we, we, are, we are looking at a complex system now. What about this? Why is it a complicated system? We know it is a complicated system, but why is it so? You cannot control the traffic. You cannot, you, you can predict the behavior to an extent, but it has a lot of parts. The structure is very, very complicated, right? So you have people inside these vehicles who are human beings, therefore complex. Right? And you have too many parts that are interacting with each other, therefore complicated. Right? So now we kind of understand what a complex system is, what a complicated system is. Right? Let us move on. We will try to skip. Okay. These are all examples of chaotic and uh, complicated systems. I will take you through a small video here. Okay. Uh, the video in itself will not tell you too much about systems thinking. It will give you a foundation of how you should start uh, thinking about or what should you be thinking about when you are saying systems thinking. And there are a couple of things that I would like to note about. Think about what, I mean, look at those keywords here. You will be looking at something called system archetypes, right? We will talk about it in a little bit more detail as we proceed with the session. Let us see this video and pay close attention to certain terms that they are using, right? And then we will talk about it in a few. Systems thinking, a way to maximize program effectiveness. Systems thinking, maybe you've heard of it, are doing it, or you've heard that you should be doing it. What is it, and what does it mean for the senior manager? Let's start by looking at what a system is. A system is any kind of entity that is made up of parts that interact. Together, these parts and their interconnections create a whole, which in turn produces some kind of result. Using a system's perspective is important because it helps us to better understand what helps or hinders the success of health interventions. Here's an example. Meet Suzanne. Suzanne is a senior manager in a large regional health organization. The high rate of obesity is an issue in her community, and she's been mandated to address this problem. Her first instinct is to develop a program to get more people active. But what is realistic to expect from this approach? 
Systems thinkers believe that viewing a program like this, part, in isolation of the larger system within which it operates, the whole, tends to ignore other aspects that might influence its potential for impact. Why? Research tells us that obesity is the result of a combination of many physiological, psychological, social, environmental, and economic factors that all interact with one another. For example, at the individual level, there are issues such as human physiology, exercise habits, food choices, and one's occupation. But beyond the individual, there are other factors at play, such as the local built environment, quick and easy access to junk food, and larger food industry practices, such as trends in portion sizes, sugar, and fat content. The interaction of all these influences make obesity the product of what we call a complex system. If Suzanne were to use a systems approach, she would realize that relying on simple linear cause and effect solutions for one program would ignore those interactions and likely fail. While Suzanne's staff at the program level have a tendency to think only within the boundaries of their program, senior managers and planners like Suzanne are in a unique position to do what systems thinkers call zooming out. Zooming out considers how other aspects outside of a program's traditional boundaries, both within the organization and beyond, might influence the success of the program. By zooming out and looking at the influence of other interventions, policies, structures, patterns, and norms in the broader system, Suzanne is better able to strategically consider other values and perspectives and the interrelationships among each that may impact obesity rates in her community. In doing so, she can identify more powerful leverage points outside of the program that have the potential to facilitate and support changes in obesity. Leverage points are places within the system that can be tweaked in a way that supports greater impact. For example, are there actions Suzanne and her team might take that could increase the community's access to opportunities for physical activity? While some leverage points are within Suzanne's capacity to change, others will be beyond her control. However, it will still be useful to be aware of these as she plans for the program. Adopting a systems view won't change the boundaries of this program, but it will expand the boundaries of the evaluation. By recognizing the importance of the different perspectives and values of those outside the program and the interrelationships throughout the system, Suzanne can ensure that the evaluation is framed in a way that captures the key boundaries, diverse perspectives, and interrelationships that serve as important leverage points in the system. Of course, Suzanne's budget won't permit an evaluation of the entire system, but she can ensure that any evaluation she commissions will provide her with more strategic direction on how to effectively address obesity within her community. For example, in addition to recommendations for improving the program, the results of the evaluation might indicate opportunities for new partnerships or external policy change. If her community has poor walking and cycling infrastructure, where might she and her team advocate? Or who could they collaborate with to make changes? By asking these questions, Suzanne is finding that using a systems approach helps her focus on the broader issue of obesity in her community instead of a single program in her organization. She gains a better understanding of what external factors are influencing the program's success and can set more reasonable expectations of what it can accomplish. She's also learning what needs to change both within and outside of the program to better maximize her organization's effectiveness. Many now believe that a systems approach holds the most promise for addressing complex health problems like obesity, which is not only good for Suzanne, but good for everyone. Okay, so you all understand this? What, what are those things, what are those keywords that you came across? And the reason why I showed you this video is because we do not have too much of time to talk about all those keywords in detail. So I thought one short video will tell you or expose you to all those terms, and terminologies and keywords that we are going to talk about. What are those keywords that you came across? Policies, patterns, events? Yes? Norms, boundaries, zoom out, leverage, partnership, yes. So, when you talk about systems thinking, systems thinking is not just a concept. It is a set of tools, you can view it as a set of tools 
plus a language with its with the vocabulary of its own. So you, you talk about all those terms which form the vocabulary of that system thinking uh, approach, and therefore it's also a language. It's also a perspective, right? It's also a perspective of how you look at things. So you talk about events, you talk about patterns, you talk about system structure, right? You talk about so they not talk about mental models and uh, vision, but we will try to cover that as part of the next uh, slides that we have. So all of this put together gives you the the discipline of systems thinking. So when you are saying I am a systems thinker, you basically know what system, what what vocabulary system think, uh, thinking uses. So you know the language of system thinking. You know the perspectives from which system thinking operates, right? And you also are very much aware about the tools and techniques, the toolbox that it offers to you, to to you know uh, enable you to look at a particular phenomena from systems perspective. Right? So we all understand this video, right? So we understand that an event, that is obesity, how it can be look, looked at from different perspectives and, and the remedial uh, measures that were taken were different at different levels. So at the event level, you could probably go and exercise, burn a few, few calories every day. But on the pattern side, you could influence the policies. On the system structure side, you could, you could decrease the portion of serving that the restaurants are giving, right? And things like that. So basically, you are operating at different perspectives, and therefore there are different remedial actions that have to be taken at each of those perspectives. So the action mode varies from the perspective that we are looking at. So let us see a system in context. We have already spoken about events, patterns, systemic structures. Let us add vision and mental models to that. On the right of it, you say, okay, your right, my left, uh, action mode. So the action mode for events is reactive. So there's a house which is burning, which is on fire. What would you do? Would you sit and try to figure out the system and the pattern and you know what would have caused it? Some changes in policy, or you would react to it immediately. Yeah. You would react to it. You would call a fire brigade, and by the time in the meanwhile you will try to do something from your side to house the fire off. That is why events will have a reactive action, right? So you look at an event and you react to it to bring it into control. When you see patterns, so the you know the fire has been probably doused off now, and then uh, over a period of time, so patterns by definition is nothing but uh, accumulated memories which are you know which are strung over a period of time. So you start getting patterns. You start recording the events of buildings on fire in the whole city, and suddenly you figure out a trend or a pattern there that a particular locality is having them having the instances of buildings being set on fire more often, right? Then that is a pattern that gives you more information than an event. So that is an adaptive way of looking at things. So you try to figure out what, what, what has to be done with that. Maybe the fire, maybe the building plans that were approved in that particular region, uh, they, they did not have the fire department clearances done properly. So probably something has to be done from that perspective. Systemic structures are more creative. So you go one level up. Systemic, actually speaking, systemic structures give rise to patterns, patterns give rise to events. Now, above all this, you have mental models. How do you view a particular system? Right? Uh, okay, to give you a different example out here, let us say there is a factory which is... Uh, so, any, any, any manufacturing unit will have some amount of defective parts that is getting produced as part of the assembly line. That is expected. So, you do not have an assembly line which has 100% parts conforming to the specifications. Let us assume that is the case. Right? So, that is an event for you. So you see, or you, it is being reported that parts being produced are defective, certain parts being produced are defective. Now you start, uh, you plot them on a time scale, and then you figure out a pattern, then when the shifts are changing, right, then the number of defective parts being produced are maximum, right. So when uh, shift A is being uh, taken over by, uh, you know, people in shift A are going to, to their homes, and people in B are taking over the assembly line, during that time frame, the number of defective parts are rising, right? That gives you a pattern. Now, systemic structure is derived from mental models. So when you say mental models, the belief that the workers on that assembly line have is that I am only responsible for my parts produced during my shift. I am not bothered about the quality of the parts being produced by the people working on the other shifts. So what happens? They leave the parts that they have produced so far with, uh, by the end of their own shift with perfect quality.
But the time frame in between changing of the shifts, whatever is happening there, nobody is bothered about that. Therefore, you see a rise or a spike in the number of defective parts being produced during that transition period. Right? Now, that mental model, that view of the system, how we view a system is uh, your mental model. Basically. That has given rise to a system structure wherein some gap was left as a matter of policy between two shifts. Right? And that's how the, uh, that those events of parts came out to be like that. Now the vision. The vision was vision is something that drives all of them. The vision drives or translates into mental models. So let us say there is a company which talks. So let us talk about the same example. Had the vision of the company been that we are not going to produce defective parts more than uh, say X per parts per million or something like that. If that is the vision from where this whole quality thing is being uh, driven, then probably the mental model would have been different. Some care would have been taken to do something about the gaps, the, some, some overlapping between the shifts would have been planned as part of that, the number of events for uh, uh, defective parts would have come down. So, in a nutshell, what we are trying to say is you can look at a system from different perspectives, from system pattern, system structure, mental model and vision. Now, how all of this theory translates into practice is what is going to be more important for us. So, let us see. Okay, we have talked about the gap. Okay. Some examples of some non-systems thinking, uh, it's from the history, we have seen a lot of comments that people gave. So, H.M. Warner from Warner Brothers said, who the hell wants to hear the actors talk? But the fact today is, we have movies that have actors who talk, who sing, who dance around the trees, and we all enjoy that. The Americans have need of the telephone, but we do not, we have plenty of passenger boys. This is how the chief engineer of the British post office reacted when the telephone was first invented and he, he tried to push back the idea saying we do not need telephones because we have enough messenger boys. So what we are trying to do out here is we are trying to think in a very linear way, right? When the world is not very linear. We are, we, this is a non-linear world. One system impacts the other, one part of the system impacts the other part of the system and you are expecting a completely different outcome out of that. So if you have more number of messenger boys, does not need, mean that you do not need telephone. A telephone could be put to use for more uh, reason than for just communication. I think the world market for computers is maybe of five machines and this was by uh, IBM and we all know the state today. TV is not going to be in the market for more than six months. People will be bored of looking at the same box all the night. So, and, and look at the people from where, where it is coming. I mean, it's, it's not from people who do not know the industry. It's from people who know the industry, who have been at the heart of things, right? So, uh, about the computers, it was Thomas Watson. He was a person at IBM, which, which is connected with the first computers, right? And he is the person who says, so, well, we are, you know, kind of very much driven by the fact that we always try to look at the world in a very linear fashion. There is no reason to think that people want to have a computer at home. Okay. We'll come back to this slide a bit later. Uh, we'll keep it part. If time permits, we'll come back to this. So this is uh, a direct uh, uh, take away from uh, Peter Sanjay's book of uh, how a learning organization is created. We'll come back to this. We talk about interdependence of systems. We have a small video here, a very short one. We'll see how one part of the system impacts other part. In the 1950s, the Dayak people of Borneo, an island in Southeast Asia, were suffering from an outbreak of malaria, so they called the World Health Organization for help. The World Health Organization had a ready-made solution, which was to spray copious amounts of DDT around the island. With the application of DDT, the mosquitoes that carried the malaria were knocked down, and so was the malaria. There were some interesting side effects, though. The first was that the roofs of people's houses began to collapse on their heads. Turns out the DDT not only killed off the malaria-carrying mosquitoes, but it also killed a species of parasitic wasps that had controlled a population of thatch-eating caterpillars. Thatch being what the roofs of the Dayak people's homes were made from. Without the wasps, the caterpillars multiplied and flourished and began munching their way through the villagers' roofs. That was just the beginning. The DDT affected a lot of the island's other insects, which were eaten by the resident population of small lizards called geckos. 
The biological half-life of DDT is around eight years, so animals like geckos do not metabolize it very fast. It stays in their system for a long time. Over time, the geckos began to accumulate pretty high levels of DDT, and while they tolerated the DDT fairly well, the island's resident cats, which dined on the geckos, did not. The cats ate the geckos, and the DDT contained in the geckos killed the cats. With the cats gone, the island's population of rats came out to play. We all know what happens when rats multiply and flourish. Pretty soon, the Dyak people were back on the phone to the World Health Organization, only this time it wasn't malaria that was the problem. It was the plague and the destruction of their grain stores, both of which were caused by the overpopulation of rats. This time, though, the World Health Organization didn't have a ready-made solution and had to invent one. What did they do? They decided to parachute live cats into Borneo. Operation Cat Drop occurred courtesy of the Royal Air Force and eventually stabilized the situation. Okay, so what, what do we see here now? So you started with a problem, you, you reacted to an event, the event of malaria being spread. You, you tried to take up a very, very reactive approach, spread DDT, and then you saw what happens uh, next. I am grossly running out of time, uh, but I would introduce you to these two things, system thinking tools. One is uh, called as the behavior over time graph, the other is called as the causal analysis loop. Right? So these two loops are two, two of the system thinking tools. There are ten of them basically that have been defined in great details in the text that you will find. But these are the two tools that have, uh, the, the two tools that you can pick up very easily. Now there are two kinds of processes that they talk about. One is the reinforcing process, the other is the balancing process. Right? Uh, the technicalities probably my time is management, I would say. I was not I, I will not be able to touch upon here. But uh, offline we can talk about this a little bit if you guys are interested. But let us talk about the core things for which uh, this session is more relevant. How does system thinking impact the agile transformations? Talk, we will talk about offline products sometime. These are the system archetypes. Okay. Now, what, what are those things that you can correlate with on this slide? So, we say, what are those things that are plaguing the agile transformations? We are trying to apply familiar solutions to new problems. Can you relate to this? So, you, you, so basically, Peter Sanjay says in his book that we are not trying to solve new problems every day. We are trying to solve the solutions that were given to the older problems. So, the older problems resulted into some solutions. Those solutions in themselves have become problems today, which we are trying to address. So, what we are basically doing is we are trying to solve yesterday's problems, yesterday's solutions. Now, here, applying familiar solutions to new problems. So, you suddenly see your team productivity coming down. What do you do? What do you do? You start having more review meetings, more tighter meetings. Okay, let me say the status. Now start sending me the daily status reports. What, what do you actually do by doing that? You are eating to the time of the productive time of the team. So you are actually making that team productivity even come fall down further, right? That's 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 because you are reacting at the event level. Basically, you just saw that the team productivity has dwindled, and therefore you said the best approach for me and the easiest one and the most reactive one would be to you know start tighter review meetings. Eating into the productive time of the team, making it further uh, degrading. Incentives, punishments, and constraints. We want to be agile, right? But we still want to reward our staff performance from the team. How do you expect that to happen? The ways and means of incentivizing, punishing, or the kind of constraints that you are imposing on uh, on your system. It has to be seen from a more systemic perspective and not just from a trigger driven perspective. You have to be you know, innovative enough to find out better means of rewarding your people rather than declaring one as a star performer and then the very next day you ask the whole team to collaborate, you know, uh, to make the agile transformation successful. That does not go anywhere. Then we, were, we use agile for coding. Testing is too complex, so we are still doing it in the waterfall way. So there is a separate testing I am making. Coding is done in agile, the rest we don't know. Testing will still happen as it used to happen. So where are we? We are trying to uh, force fix certain things. We are trying to again solve yesterday's problems. Your request for workflow change will be processed through the monthly CCB meetings. And all of them are live examples. 
Yes, I have five minutes left, and I will try to cover most of them. <coughs> These are all from live experiences. This is what I am seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. I request for a workflow change in the Jira tool, for example, and my tools team says we are evaluating that as part of the monthly CCP meeting that we have. We evaluate, analyze, and then we will see whether it works for us or not. Then we will get back to you. Once the team is in the, running the sprint mode of two weeks, and you are seeing a monthly CCP meeting, how does it add up, right? Okay, the we are agile, the customer is not, so the customer is still expecting, you know, its own milestone based deliveries. Your HR finance purchase is not agile, purchase says you need a target, you fill up a purchase requisition form, we will evaluate it, we will invite quotations from vendors and then we will see which one, the, which, one which is our, whether they are in the preferred vendor list or not and then we will see what to do with that. Okay, the balance of stock and flows. Uh, I, I will not be able to touch on that because we did not introduce the concepts out here, we have to skip that. So what do we do in such a case? Uh, we take a systemic view, draw the system diagram, we can talk about it a bit later uh, offline because we did not say how to do that. Look out for leverage points. Leverage points are areas wherein with the application are, are, are the easiest and the lowest in the handling force basically. So you find out a leverage point which will give you the best return in the least possible investment. So find out the right leverage points. Leverage points are available at each of those perspectives. Events level, leverage points will be there, systemic level will be there. You have to find out the right one which gives you the right balance everywhere. And then again your system boundary comes into picture. You cannot influence the organization policies today as you know as a scrum master of a team. But then you have to find out the right balance where you can have that leverage points for your maximum advantage. Identify the system archetypes. There are 10 kinds of system archetypes that have been talked about. These are the common cluster of problems, basically the common types of problems. And they have a suggested path that you can take to solve or address those issues. Look at those. Look at the organization the system, okay? Look for and uh, look for and address the causes and not the symptoms. Uh, not Don't be trigger happy, don't be event driven approach. Structure influences behavior, the way your structure, your organization is structured, it influences your behavior and therefore it also influences the kind of products that you are building. So it is said uh, and accepted very widely that the team, the team's personality is reflected in the products that they build. Okay? So look at that. Today's problems come from yesterday's solutions. So localized solutions merely shift the problem from one part of the system to the other. We talked about it. And the harder you push, the harder the system pushes back. It's called as compensating feedback in the system's thinking terminology. And it says that sometimes your well-intentioned desire to, you know, um, correct the system may result in a response that offsets the balance or the benefits that the system is expecting. Which means, uh, in, in, in the HR terminology, it is called as deontological ethics. So I start off with saying that, okay, my aim for doing this particular thing is this, which is a good a good intention uh, thing, but I end up doing something uh, that, that ends up getting you know offset. This is offsetting the system, and the balance is distorted in not in my favor. Right. That's what the compensating feedback talks about. Yeah. So basically, this is uh, more or less what I wanted to talk about initially. You know, when I was uh, trying to build up the PPT, I thought 45 minutes would be sufficient for me to cover the whole stuff. But now I realize that. <laughs> Yeah, it's not that simple. So I'm sorry for uh, missing out certain things. We can catch up after the session, right? And then we can talk about the different kinds of tools that we have in the system thinking toolbox. Yeah, thanks for being good and participative uh, learners. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any oh, questions? Yeah. Uh, we have one minute left. Uh, or we could take it uh, at the end. <laughs> <laughs> we'll ask in the open house. Yeah. So yeah. That would be better. So save, save the time. <laughs> yeah. sure. So I think I had another interesting uh, perspective to give us all uh, the systems thinking. Thank you, Prince, for that.